This is Research Like a Pro, episode 150, John Eisenhower Case Study, part one. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist's Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Research Like a Pro today. Hi, Nicole. How are you doing? Doing good. I'm excited because I started working on my portfolio again, and I decided to just work on it for 30 minutes a day. That is great. Isn't it amazing what kind of progress you can make in 30 minutes a day? Yes. And I just feel like if I'm in the habit of working on it regularly, at least five days a week, maybe I will some days be able to spend a little longer on it. Because once you get going, sometimes it's hard to stop. Right. (laughs) What about you? Well, in my reading this morning, I picked up the Georgia Genealogical Society quarterly that just came in the mail and started reading that. I do, you know, a little reading in my genealogy sources every morning. And the first article is kind of fun. It was an article about a little known story or a historical fact, I guess, that when the Spanish were coming up from their colony in St. Augustine, Florida, and had a fight with the British in the Georgia colony. So that was interesting, 1742, just reading a little bit about that and realizing there was some conflict there between the two different countries and their colonies in the New World. I always love digging in a little bit to the history, learning something new. That's fun that you have that in your stack of reading material. Yeah, I do have a stack of reading material, that's for sure. I know, I've been in your room, I've seen it. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. And kind of going back to that 30 minutes a day, I try to do 30 minutes of reading. And so that's how I've gotten through all these different genealogy books. You know, 30 minutes a day, reading a couple of pages from each one on my stack, I get through them. It's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good goal. Let's see, we have a couple announcements. Uh, We just finished our Research Like a Pro study group that was going on this spring. So the next study group that we'll be doing will be our Research Like a Pro with DNA study group this fall, and it will begin the 1st of September, and registration for that begins June 1st. So if you're interested in signing up, make sure to put that on your calendar, and there is an early bird discount if you sign up that first week in June. You can sign up on our website to join our study group email list, and then you will get a notification when the registration begins for that. Now, if you are somebody who has experience incorporating DNA evidence into your reports, maybe you've read our book about Research Like a Pro with DNA or taken our study group before or e-course, and you're interested in becoming a peer group leader for that study group this fall, we'd invite you to apply to become what we used to call mentors, but now we're calling it a peer group leader. So you can apply by sharing with us your resume and one of your reports incorporating DNA evidence. And the application is available if you just go to our website at familylocket.com slash RLP dash mentors. And we'll put the link to that in the show notes, but we'd love to have you apply. And if you do get accepted, you can receive your study group registration for free. So we're looking for several peer group leaders to help with leading smaller groups of study group members in a weekly discussion and giving feedback to them. Also, be sure to join our regular Family Locket newsletter so that you can get notifications of any kind of coupons that we might have going on during conferences or any other discounts and news that comes up. I'm so excited to think about doing a DNA project this fall. I already have one in mind that I've been wanting to tackle, and I am excited to really dig in. It seems like the city groups are when I get my best research done on my own family. Right, and I think that's why so many people return to our study groups again and again, because it really is helpful and motivational to have that peer group accountability and be able to have deadlines to get your own research done. 
Yeah, I know in this past study group that we just completed, one of the favorite things for everyone was their smaller peer group meetings where they talked through their projects and got ideas for how to do every part of the process. So with DNA, that's just as important to have that small group. So we're, we're excited for the fall group. Well, today we are going to do a case study of the project I did for the past study group, and it's on our great, great, great grandfather, John Eisenhower. This will be a two part series. Today we will talk about the first part of the project, and then the next episode we'll finish it up. So let's just dive into my objective. When I was trying to think about what I wanted to research, I wanted to find a project in Missouri because I had taken the Salt Lake Institute course on Missouri in January, and I thought it would be really fun to do more research from my own family in Missouri. And we have this John D. Eisenhower who had moved from North Carolina into Cape Girardeau and didn't really know a lot about him. You know, you had researched his sons for your very first project, right? Right. I was preparing for a Roots Tech lecture about the Civil War and just finding sources about Confederate soldiers. And I chose the Eisenhower brothers because I knew at least one of them had fought for the Confederacy. And my research question was if his other two brothers also fought for the Confederacy. And if so, you know, where did they serve and that kind of thing. So that was kind of my hope was to discover that. Our direct ancestor, Barnett Eisenhower, died in the 1850s. So he wasn't part of the Civil War, but I thought maybe his other three brothers who lived maybe were. So I did find out that two out of the three were involved. So it was an interesting case. Yeah. And in doing that, you filled out a lot of the family information, found out some details about the family once they were in Cape Girardeau. But when we had started researching this Eisenhower line, pretty quickly we connected back to the Eisenhowers of North Carolina. And then that line from there went all the way back to Germany because it's connected with President Dwight D. Eisenhower's line. He's our fourth cousin, I believe. And so, of course, his line had been researched well. And I didn't really feel the draw to research this line that much. You know, when you find out someone has already done a lot of it, sometimes you don't feel like you need to research. And some of our other lines were completely completely open. Nobody that we know of had researched them. So we went that direction. So I wanted to explore John Eisenhower and I had a specific research question. We teach that your objective needs to be focused in. So rather than say something like learn all about John Eisenhower, which seems kind of overwhelming. Sometimes that's our overarching research question. We want to know everything about our ancestor, but then to do a project, we need to focus in. And so I did focus in, and this is this is how I wrote up my objective. Discover why and when John D. Eisenhower's family moved to Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the early 1800s. John was born about 1779 in Lincoln County, North Carolina, and died March of 1844 in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. John married Sarah Bailey on 3 February 1811 in Lincolnton, Lincoln, North Carolina. Great objective. You know, we had a lot of information about his later life and his marriage and things, but not a lot about prior to Missouri. So that was a good objective to focus on why they came and just more about that event. Yeah, it was kind of a little dark hole in the history of this family that I wanted to explore. And I know that there are records in North Carolina and Missouri that could pinpoint some things. And so uh, I had my objective knowing that it was likely I would be able to find some information. Not to mention that I also wanted to explore the history of the area and see what the push and pull factors for migration would be. Why did this man leave his family and move west? And I wanted just to see what I could pull out of the records and the history So the next step after creating that objective is the timeline analysis. And I did this in Airtable. In our Airtable template, we've got a place to do the timeline and analysis as well as the research log, which is great. I really like how we have those both in the same base so that you can kind of go back and forth checking information. And I basically just went from what we had previously known There was information on family search. There was information in our ancestry tree. 
So at this point, I didn't do any research. I just gathered up all the things that we previously had, which really didn't turn out to be a lot. It was censuses and that marriage record and the probate. That was pretty much it. So in your timeline, did you create events for like the children's births and things, or did you just put in one entry for each record you had? First of all, I wanted to make sure I had a good birth date for John. So I put in every census that he was mentioned in of his life, which turned out to be 1810, 30, and 40, those three censuses, both as birth and then also as residence. And then because I also wanted to pinpoint a time frame when they moved, I decided to work with the oldest two known children, Mahela and Valentine, and put some information about them into the timeline, which was also known, specifically some censuses that said where they were born and when they were born, Mm -hmm. because I thought that would help, you know, were they born in North Carolina or were they born in Missouri? Can we get a pinpoint time when the move happened. And so I did use some of the children's information, but I didn't by any means put it all in. I sort of picked through the records to see what would help me for this objective. That's a good point because sometimes when we're building the timeline with the known information, we're like, should we put in all of the children's information? And really, I like the answer that you should just put in what will help you with your current objective. And that's kind of neat looking at the birth of, you know, when Mahala was born, the fact that in the 1850 census, she was married. So we can look at that and see her age and where she was reportedly born, North Carolina. So 1850, she's age 40, she's married, looks like, and she was born in North Carolina. So now we know the family probably lived in North Carolina in 1810. And an interesting thing about this oldest daughter that I discovered from doing this timeline analysis, which often happens, we discover more, that in 1810, the 1810 census, John Eisenhower had a wife and children, and then he marries in 1811, a Sarah Bailey. So this is a second marriage, and I need to do a project now to really nail down the first wife. There are some theories out there from other researchers that I came across, and I want to look at that myself. But now I'm wondering, was Mahala the daughter of Sarah Bailey, or was she a daughter from the first marriage? Oh. You know, that's an, another question that we really haven't considered in our research of this family. That is interesting. So we don't know who the first wife was. Like I say, there is a suggestion, but there were also some conflicting things. And so it definitely is a subject for another project huh. to to track down some more information on that. Yeah. So that was, you know, one of my questions. And this so often happens when we're doing the timeline and going back over the records that questions do arise. Back in the day, I would have started researching that. (laughs) (laughs) But because we focus on a project and an objective, that can go into future research and become another project of its own without going down that rabbit hole. Wow, that's so interesting. Now that I pull up the 1810 census here in your research log, there were like four boys under 10 and two females under 10. Right. So we know that there are some other children out there. Those early years, sometimes it's really difficult to find them, but it is a possibility. So the birth of the oldest son, Valentine, is another interesting thing. Now, these children are named in John's will. So that's how we know that they were his children, these two older children. Valentine has a conflict in his birth. Turned out he was born in either 1816 or 1820. In both times, however, he was born in North Carolina. So 1816 made sense, but I came across the 1820 census when I was looking at that and I saw that there's only one John Eisenhower listed and he was an older man. In 1810, there was a junior and a senior noted on the census. And we often see that whether they were father and son or, you know, could be an uncle and a nephew or no relation. It's just the older and the younger person on the census, they will designate them junior and senior. So in 1820, there was only this older John, and so it made me wonder, had our younger John already moved from North Carolina to Missouri? And if so, 
was Valentine born in 1820? You know, it raised some more questions. When was he born and where were they in 1820? Oh, okay. So we're looking at Lincoln County, North Carolina, where your research subject lived with his father, probably the elder John Eisenhower. Then 10 years later in 1820, our research subject appears to be gone because all there is left is the elder John Eisenhower. Absolutely. So that was a little clue there that I needed to really explore the records right around 1820. And then the next record we actually have him in is the 1830 census in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, 1840 census, same place, and then his probate and will in Cape Girardeau. So you'll see that period of time in between his marriage, the record of 1811 and 1830 in the census, there's quite a gap of records. Uh So that's what I wanted to pinpoint. So we have the 1811 marriage to Sarah Bailey in Lincoln County, North Carolina. And then Valentine was probably born in 1816 or 1820 in North Carolina. But in 1820, John D. Eisenhower is not living in North Carolina anymore, at least in Lincoln County. Right. So you do have a big gap there. Exactly. And the children start getting married in Cape Girardeau. But, you know, after 1830, so 1831, and then there's other records there. So that gap is what I really wanted to focus in and research. So after the timeline analysis, the next step is to create a locality guide. So did you decide to focus on Lincoln County, North Carolina, or Cape Girardeau? I decided to do Cape Girardeau because I thought maybe that's where a lot of the records would be. And because I didn't have anything but the 1830 census at that time. Plus, I had done a Missouri guide for part of the Institute course, I had created a really good state guide for Missouri and kind of the focus of this project was researching in Missouri. But I knew I also needed a little bit of information on Lincoln County. And I knew that I would be likely using land and tax records. And I knew that I could use the family search catalog to put those into my research plan. So because the research wasn't going to take place a lot in Lincoln County, I decided I could just do kind of a cursory look at that county and the records. That sounds like a reasonable plan. So let's kind of talk more about your Cape Girardeau guide. This is a county within Missouri. County guides are fun because you do get to go a little deeper than a state guide. Were you focused more on the historical information or where to find records or equally both? I did both. Like I said, I was interested in the why. So the histories were important, but I also knew I needed to explore record availability. So the first thing I always put in my locality guides is a little quick fact section. And I used the Family Search Wiki. Family Search had on the wiki a great page for Cape Girardeau County, Missouri genealogy. And I was able to to copy and paste in that information that the county was organized in 1812, and it was an original county of Missouri territory. Its county seat was Jackson, and it gave me all the neighboring counties because often the records we want or the information we want could be in a neighboring county. So I like putting that front and center in my locality guide. And then I also did links to the wiki so I could have a direct link to go straight back there and to the family search catalog. And I also put in some places within those smaller townships in case the research pointed me to some of those places within that I would want to research. And then I did maps because I love having maps, trying to see where this county is in relationship to everything else and put in some links to the cities and villages. So just kind of a good geographic look at this place. That's nice to really get your bearings and figure out where in the state is this county located and what are the major towns and things. Right. And one of the reasons this was an early county is it's right on the Mississippi River. And that's where settlement was in Missouri at the very beginning was right along that Mississippi River. And Cape Girardeau is right there on the border with the river. Then into my guide, I also put links to other map collections And I had learned about a lot of these during my institute course and had them in my Missouri guide already. So it was really easy to copy some of those 
general Missouri maps right into my county guide. So that's kind of the nice thing about having a state guide. When you go to do a county guide within the state, you can just copy and paste some of the information that's relevant to that county as well. Then you have it all in one place for your research. That's nice to have those links there. I see that you have some general maps of Missouri from 1804 to 1889 from mapofus.org. And then you also have some that are more specific, like the Cape Girardeau County Townships from histopolis.com. There's so many resources for maps and geography and things. Absolutely. And it's fun to corral them all into one place on your guide. Now, I also did put in some things from the Family Search catalog, some books and a CD-ROM that were only available at the Family History Library, just because I wanted this to be thorough. And I thought, well, if I can get up there to the library, I can look at these and I'll just have them for any future research, even if I don't use them with this project. So I decided mm -hmm. to put those in as well. Then I also had a pretty good section on migration routes because this was a migrating ancestor. So I felt like it was important to include some good information about immigration and immigration into Missouri. Did you find anything that was immediately helpful as you looked at the migration routes there? I did find some interesting things where it talked about how a lot of the settlers were from Tennessee to the specific area. And as I continued researching, I found that there were specific groups that came from North Carolina as well, and specifically Lincoln. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, people were probably coming in from all over, but there were some trends that you can kind of see. Right. And the Family Search Wiki under Migration had talked about how the settlers were coming mainly from Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois but that was to Missouri as a whole. And so I was focusing in on something a little bit more specific. And I found a really great book that I was not able to look at yet. Maybe I'll have to order it, but it's by Marsha Hoffman Rising and it's called Opening the Ozarks, First Families in Southwest Missouri. So I was really curious about that. And when I get to the library next, I want to look that up and see if the Eisenhowers were mentioned in that because they were right there in that area of Southwest Missouri. Oh, that'll be neat. Yeah. So after doing the migration, the geography, and the maps, I did have a section on law and government because we want to make sure we understand the laws that our ancestors were living under. And I linked to my notes from my institute course because Judy Russell had done two classes for us on early Missouri laws. So that was really nice because I had that in a Google Doc and my locality guides in a Google Doc, I just linked to my notes. And then I also put in a good link to a book on Haughty Trust, which is all about the laws of Missouri up to the year of 1824. So that was kind of fun that I had that nice resource that I could just plug right into my guide. Yeah, that is handy. I love linking Google Docs because so easy to click on it and open up the doc rather than go find it in your files. <laughs> right. So whenever I do listen to a lecture or a webinar and they have got a syllabus or something on a specific place, I like to put a link to that or a note in my locality guide to go look at that. And sometimes I'll take information from it, but sometimes it's just arranged so nicely and you don't necessarily want to copy and paste the whole thing into your guide, but you can give yourself a reminder that you have this information. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Next, I wanted to do a section on the libraries and archives, and I made myself a note to see additional libraries and archives on my Missouri State Locality Guide because that was pretty extensive. But in this one, I put things like the County Courthouse and the Cape Girardeau County Archives Center and the Research Center. So some things that were very specific to Cape Girardeau. And then I knew that I had all the other Missouri larger repositories in my Missouri Guide and a note to go check that. And then I also put a note for the Genealogy Society and the Historical Society just for the county. I put a link to the website, phone number, address, if I was going to need to contact them. It's good to have that information right there. Yeah. And then the thing that I always like to put in is the record loss section 
the county courthouse, what happened to it? And in this case, I learned that it was destroyed by fire in 1870, but many records remain. And we've talked about that before, how sometimes we see the courthouse burned and we think of complete destruction, but we need to dig a little deeper and see what was saved. And maybe there's a lot more there than you think. Yes. And that can sometimes be tricky to figure out, but I've just found that going to the family search catalog and seeing what's available for that county is often a good way to see what they have left. Exactly. And then I had a section on local history and I was thrilled to see that several of the books on local history were online at the Missouri Digital History website that we talked about a few episodes ago. And so I always love it when these books are digitized and I can see them. Family Search also had a book. So out of the books that I put into my guide, I have six history books and four of them were digitized. Wow, that's wonderful. Next, I had some reference books that just kind of explained the early Missouri archives, and it gave a list of the collection of archives and manuscripts of the Cape Girardeau County Historical Society. So that was another one that looked interesting, and it had a digital version as well. And then I got to my record collections on the Family Search Wiki. There's a little table there that I always like to copy and paste into my log that tells when the birth, marriage, death, court, land, probate, and census records start. And that gives you a really good idea for what you can find. And in this case, even though the courthouse burned in 1870, I saw that marriage, court, land, and probate all started early, 1805, 1815, 1821. So how great is that? That is great. In some other burned counties that I've seen, they do sometimes have some records from early on, but there's not very many. So I always wonder, were these records just a few of the ones that used to exist and then some of them were destroyed and some remained? And sometimes I try to get a picture of how many records there are versus how many there are in like other counties around that same time to kind of get an idea. <laughs> and, right. and you can kind of say, the marriage record I was looking for is not there and there's only 100 marriage records from 1800 to 1860. So that's kind of a sign that they're missing quite a few. Right. And that's good to put in your research notes. And it's also good when you have a negative search to note that, well, they don't have very many records, even though it says they start at this time period. So I then just put in a lot of different links to record collections. I found cemetery records. And of course, we have the federal census records. But there were also some special censuses for Cape Girardeau and county censuses and then the Missouri State and Territorial Census records. So it's always nice to have all those extra censuses besides the ones that we usually use. Then I put in some church record links because sometimes church records can give us some new information that hasn't been discovered. And I did quite a lengthy section on court records. Court records for our early ancestors can be really helpful because they were often mentioned in court records. They sat on juries and they worked on the roads. They had lawsuits with their neighbor over the land. You know, there's so many different things where they were very involved with the courts. So that can be a great resource for this time period. And I did quite a lengthy discussion of the court records because I wanted to have that information right there. Then for ethnic records, I also put in a lot of the African-American sources for the area. And although this group of ancestors did not enslave people, I thought for future reference, in case I have a project that includes African-Americans, it would be good to have those links right there about the slaveholders and the different things we could use to research the African-Americans in that county. You didn't find that the Eisenhowers were a slaveholding family? I did not find that they did in Missouri. It wasn't part of my research objective to really dive into that, but I did not see a sign of that in this one. That doesn't mean I, maybe I would find something, but I, I didn't see any sign of it. It's interesting to think about that because Missouri was one of those border states. And so some were slaveholders and others were not. And in a previous podcast episode, we actually talked about how the German people tended to be less pro-slavery than their neighbors. I did find when I researched the sons that one of them, Moses Eisenhower, worked as a plantation manager. I forgot what it's called. The overseer. 
Yes, he was an overseer. Thank you. He didn't own his own slaves, but he worked as an overseer. And then the other son, Josiah Eisenhower, ended up moving down to New Orleans. And his business imported cotton and sugar and things. But we also found a deed where he was selling a slave for one of his clients. So it's interesting to see that although they didn't own their own slaves, they were still kind of involved in that slave economy. Yeah, I agree. And I would like to do a little bit more research now that you bring that up and look at the family in North Carolina and in Missouri and see what we could find about that for another project. Well, to finish out my guide, I had links to land records because I knew land was super important. I wanted to know when John might have purchased land, which would give me good clues about when he came into the area. And I saw that our colleague, Bill Edelman, had two books that were at the Family History Library, and he had indexed the Missouri Deeds and land records. So I thought that was super helpful. Anytime I can use a published index where someone has gone to the trouble of going through all the records and publishing that, that is such a great resource. But then I also saw that the deed records were digitized on Family Search, so I had some options there. And then I put a little bit in on military records and some on newspapers and probate and then the vital records. So I did do quite an extensive guide for this county. There were a lot of records, a lot of resources. And because our family did settle there, I thought maybe we'd want to continue researching in the area. And it was for the study group. And I like to do a lot of work when I'm doing an assignment for the study group. (laughs) Yeah, I noticed that you're locality guide didn't just cover that time period that you were most interested in for John D. Eisenhower's migration to Missouri, but that you did include record collections for later in the 19th century and beyond. So that is good, setting yourself up to use this resource and record collections in future research projects. Yeah, and I think I did that just because I found so much good information. And while I was there, I thought I might as well put it in. You know, sometimes you come across a great website and it's just easy to put in the links and the information and save you some time in the long run. When you were doing the guide, did any certain record collections jump out to you as something you would want to add to your research plan? Definitely the land. That was really key. And then I wanted to find tax records as well, which seemed to be caught up in the court records. So those are kind of the main early things that you find. So I was mostly interested in that, as well as maybe some of the territorial censuses or state censuses. I was curious if John Eisenhower would show up in something early there. Great. And did you notice that these were all digitized or would you have to get help on site? You know, a lot of things were digitized. I felt like I could easily start with what was digitized. Well, good. It's always successful to make a locality guide and see what's available and then start making your research plan after that. So in our next episode, we get to talk about research planning. Right. Well, I hope everyone listening has enjoyed a little deep dive into how I started out this project with doing the objective, which focused me in, and then the timeline analysis, looking at what we knew, and then doing my locality guide. Yes. So next episode, we'll go through the steps in the Research Like a Pro process that come after that. We'll do the research plan and the research log citations and the research report. So we'll talk to you guys again next week. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for listening. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your research. If you want to learn more, purchase our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist's Guide on Amazon.com and other booksellers. You can also register for our Research Like a Pro online course or join our next study group. Learn more at familylocket.com. To share your progress and ask questions, join our private Facebook group by sending us your book receipt or joining our e-course or study group. If you like what you heard and would like to support this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.